all clean up, but look on the ASA. My gosh, they're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. That UFO podcast is powered by Zencaster. Zencaster is one of the world's leading platforms for recording and hosting podcasts. The open beta strives to put the power of studio quality remote video production into the hands of anyone with a story to tell. Features include HD video recording, studio quality sound, chat and footnotes. All running right from your browser so you can record from anywhere without ever installing anything. Check out the links in the show description to find out more. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. We're kicking off December with a bonus episode. This is one that I did not plan on doing at all, honestly. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've had quite a few DMs and emails from people asking to cover a particular case. Now, I I always got back to those people saying why I wasn't particularly interested necessarily uh, and why I thought there wasn't much to it, but people have requested. And yesterday, I was discussing it with some of my colleagues from UAP Media. And as I was discussing the case, uh, I got an email again from a listener asking to to do a show on it or a bit of a deep dive. So we decided, you know what, let's get on, let's record, let's share our, share our opinions and, and put it out there for people to make up their own mind. Um, so uh, February 26, 2016, in a small town in Wales called Penturk, something unusual is claimed to have happened. Multiple witnesses claim to have seen crafts, lights, orbs, odd snow, men in hazmat suits, all in an incredible experience. One of the main witnesses, Kaz Clark, has since become a bit of a name on the the circuit for UFOs and has since appeared on various channels and articles, news websites, sharing her story, uh, as well as the the story of other witnesses who who are part of this. I've not picked it up myself because in speaking to a few serious researchers and respected researchers, there seems to be a lot of issues with the story with the incident and everything around it that for me points to the fact that this was not an extraterrestrial experience. So what I've done is invite Dave Partridge from Shadows Your Mind magazine and Graham Rendell, author and friend as they both are of mine from UAP Media UK to discuss this with us and just break down what exactly went on. So first off, Graham, how are we? Fine, Andy, how are you? Yes, I'm good. Uh, I'm looking forward to speaking about this because I think it's only fair we we give this some time and put it out there for people who want to to hear it discussed. And Dave, are you with us as well? Yeah, how are you doing, mate? Awesome. Yeah, I'm good. So, yeah, listen, both of you gents, I highly respect your opinion. And we don't always all agree on stuff, which I, I like, but this is one where you've both presented in the group chat and in individual chats and face to face when we met up uh, some some really well thought out points as to why Penturk wasn't a a UFO case or experience. As a general overview, Graham, let's start with yourself. Uh, On Penturk, what have been your your thoughts and opinions on on the case since it's sort of come to light? So the first thing I came across when I heard the individual elements of the story it was only a first. There was only a first impression of a couple of things that I, I first heard about, and it was well, that's intriguing. I want to know more, like you would with any other case. But then, as I heard more and more about all the different elements and everything that's supposed to have happened that evening, and over the next day, then it just seemed to me that this was a, a case that was too good to be true, and it was something that basically you'd got elements of maybe five or six great cases and then somebody just let you throw them all together into one super case. And to me, that didn't quite add up. So that's sort of set alarm bells ringing with me as to, well, come on, you know, there must be either more to this story in terms of more rational explanation or something else going on. But what about all these individual elements? You know, how, how true are they? How do they stack up with each other? Is there anything that could explain what was going on? So went from there. Cool. And Dave, what about yourself? What, what sort of things stood out for you when you first heard about the incident? 
Well, the first time I heard of it would have been on the uh, Paranormal Scholar YouTube uh, channel. Um, they did a video on the 3rd of May saying, oh, it's the greatest UFO cover-up of modern times. Um, I thought, all right, I'll see what this is all about. And I was watching a video, and as I was watching a video, and Kaz Clark was visiting all these different locations where she claimed she saw, you know, pyramid, giant pyramid craft and, you know, these UFOs appearing from nowhere. I was actually doing research at the time, um, as she was speaking. So I was on Google Earth, or I was checking out all these locations. And as I was doing so, things didn't add up to me. Um, so after I watched the video, I started digging around a bit and doing other research, and I've come um, to believe that it's actually not a UFO event at all. And, and this is why I've obviously massive respect for both of you and the work you both put in. And Graham, I always see your expertise, particularly if from a military point of view. You're really good with that kind of stuff. Your encyclopedic knowledge that you both have is phenomenal not to blow too much smoke up your backsides <laughs> and dave yourself as well but again just the research and the knowledge you have particularly of those ufo cases from the uk so when you both come to me and say there's there's nothing to this and here's why and you laid out a lot of really interesting things on the table this is what i want to get across to the listeners again don't take what what graham and dave or myself have as an opinion and make it your own you've got to make up your own mind but we're just putting another case across for this that says look there's a lot to say that this one wasn't a ufo case necessarily there was something unidentified but th there's a few issues with it dave we'll, we'll keep on with yourself then so you you said you started seeing some some issues with the case what was the things that jumped out straight away for you that that got you really questioning this one well the first thing was um this alleged bold patch in a in one of the fields where um kaz was you know, where she claimed that a UFO had touched, touched ground, almost landed, or had hovered about 10 feet above the ground. Um, the story has changed since the original event as well, so that's another reason why, you know, I kind of wanted to look into it. Um, and the fact that she, we only have her testimony and that of her neighbour and subsequently a researcher called Gary Jones, um, we only have their word to take for all this. You know, there's been nothing else. But this bowl patch I was looking at, and I found the location on Google Earth. And Google Earth has these um, historic timeline feature, so you can mm -hmm. look back at various satellite photos, or you know, from the Google balloon or the Google plane or whatever. And so I identified the field where this bowl patch was, and then I went back through the various years, and I could not see any change in the. Um, in the foliage or the um, scrubland in that particular field at all. So once I discovered that, I started looking at other elements of that story. Um, and that's when I found out that um, on that particular night, the 25th and the 26th of February 2016, there was a special forces training exercise called Exercise Comedian, which was taking place in the Clantrissan area. Um, so I started looking into that. Um, and Exercise Comedian is a biannual, multi-operational um, special forces training exercise, which includes the Air Force, the Army, the Royal Navy. Um, and it's just, um, nope. yeah, Exercise Comedian is a multidisciplinary um, special forces training exercise, contains the Air Force, the, the Army, and the Navy. Um, it usually starts in Scotland or the northeast of the UK and then makes its way down to Wales. Um, obviously, the Brecon Beacons is a favoured training um, site of the SAS. So when I found out that this particular exercise was taking place at that exact time, on that exact night, that Kaz Clark is saying this UFO appeared and she's claiming that, you know, the, the military was there and they were awaiting this UFO to turn up. You know, that's another reason why I started uh, debating what what she was actually claiming. And let me ask Dave now, it's it's something that's easily thrown at these things that, oh, it was a military exercise. I've <laughs> said myself, to not be a hypocrite, that the Phoenix Lights is probably my favourite UFO case, given it's how recent it was, and it was just frustratingly 
off of is having really good cameras to pick up that kind of stuff a few years away from cell phones being really popular and having videos and we could have had an incredible like you know kind of mass sighting on camera yeah. but we we had the cover-up from that point of view that it was a military exercise it was flares dropping however you're saying this is a, a biannual so twice a year exercise yeah. and i take it this had happened before february 2016 this wasn't the first no it wasn't the first one and you know, the two weeks prior, it had been taking place in the north of England and in Scotland. You know, uh, in earlier this year, uh, it was taking place, you know, in, around Dundee, and then it moved down to Wales two weeks later. Um, so, you know, you have various different aircraft that are involved in this, and Graham can probably tell you more about those. Yeah, let's hand over then, Graham. From a military point of view, you've got a fantastic knowledge. Kaz and others claim to have seen large craft rings of lights. Um, there's various artists' impressions of those being drawn up. What is it likely that they were actually seeing uh, on this occasion? To be honest, because I wasn't there, I can't actually say. However, I can speak to Chameleon in terms of, yes, it's true, it's on twice a year, and it goes back a fair while. It, it's long before 2016. And if you look at the um, some of the, the enthousi- aircraft enthusiast um, forums on the internet, you'll be able to find out which particular aircraft were involved, and even down to the actual serials of the individual aircraft that were taking part in the exercise and each time round. Now, these particular aircraft were based, up, as you say, in the north of England to start with, and they were operating out of Leeming and Dishforth, which are aircraft, airfields in North Yorkshire. So you had helicopters, you had uh, Hercules transports, um, you, you, you had other aircraft involved in it. Um, and they were all to do with this, this exercise, which was also involving elements of the special forces. So, But some of the elements that were, they were coming out with in terms of the story, and I'll just pick a couple at, at random, if you don't mind, uh, just to go through these. Because, yeah, sure. again, I can't really answer what the individual things were um, because they're, they're quite difficult to pin down. But in terms of red and green lights, I mean, they're navigation lights uh, on an aircraft. So there's one possible explanation. But also, they could have been the kind of um, LED, uh, LED kind of lights that you have are strapped to the legs of people who are parachuting, because that's a particular thing that uh, they do nowadays as well. And you can actually buy those things, I think, on eBay even. Um, you know, people have uh, pointed these out that, um, you know, that, that, that they're kind of identifying marks, especially for exercise. You want to see where people go in the dark, because these people were being parachuted in the dark um, in, in terms of the exercise. So there's another possible explanation for these red and green lights that were flying around the skies. But then there's other parts of the story. Um, the mention in, in one particular case uh, of a, an E3 Sentry aircraft, which is a, an AWACS, an early warning uh, the aircraft, the ones that have the big mushrooms on top of them for the airborne radar. And it was flying at very, at very low level, according to, the, according to the story. Now, if you're flying down a Welsh valley, now that's fair enough for fast fast jets, for you know, for typhoons and, and other aircraft like that, the ground attack aircraft, the fighter aircraft. But an, a large airframe, basically a converted civil airliner, which it's not quite, but it's near enough, uh, an analogy, like the E3 uh, AWAC, uh, AWACS aircraft, doesn't go down you know, one of the, the kind of you know, a mountain valley at low level because they're not built for that thing, for that kind of flight, first of all. But also, it's beyond the mission parameters because the idea of an airborne radar is that it sits at altitude because then the radar can see it at a much greater distance. If you put it in a mountain valley, then it's not going to see very far. So it, it, it just makes sense at all. They don't even train flying down valleys. You never, ever see them. The only time you ever see one of those aircraft at lower level is either possibly at an air show which is very rare, or you see them coming into land or taking off. So that bit didn't make sense either. And anybody, people I've spoke to who have a more of a knowledge of the RAF than I do and have experience of flying in the RAF couldn't come up with an explanation either as to why an E3 Sentry would be flying at lower level. So there's there's one thing. Okay, so there's another element of the story which I heard that was to do with uh, a possible royal connection. So this speaks to the kind of throwing everything at the kitchen sink at the story. And there was a mention of one of the Royal Flight um, BAE-146 four-engine jet transports that's a, a VIP aircraft, and it had come into, Car- uh, into Cardiff Airport with what they said was a kitty uh, call sign. Now, that's a, a fairly standard RAF call sign for this particular flight. Um, and they were saying that there was a royal connection, that there was something, in, you know, some kind of involvement with senior 
uh, RAF officials being brought into Cardiff Airport to either oversee or to do something with this uh, exercise about chasing this UFO down. But as it turns out, the Royal Flight aircraft, when it uses Kitty as a call sign, it's a positioning flight to pick up a Royal. When there are no Royals on board one of these aircraft, they use the call sign Kitty. When one is, they use the call sign Kitty Hawk. And when it returned to London later that evening, it was using a Kitty Hawk call sign. And it actually picked up, I think it was Prince Charles that had picked up. Uh, he was either visiting somewhere in the area as some kind of official function that day, and it was to take him home. So, you know, there's an explanation for that as well. So there are various elements to the story which have an aviation side, which have been sort of purported to be, you know, included in this whole elaborate story about this this huge event. But actually, when you look at them individually, none of them really either make sense or they have perfectly, you know, rational explanations, which, you know, you just explain these things away. So uh, that doesn't stand up. That These elements don't stand up for me, I'm afraid. On you go, Dave. Yeah, um, just to add to Graham's uh, Kitty Hawk explanation, um, on social media, on that very night, there were, you know, tweets and Facebook posts from local residents complaining about the noise of the helicopters and, you know, there's um, all these explosions and bangs and people were, were, were worried that there was something going on. Um, however, this was explained by South Wales police at the time on all these social media channels that it was a military exercise. Now, one social media post did make the comment that the Welsh rugby union team was staying in a nearby hotel because they had a game coming up, and that's why Prince William is um, a president of the Welsh rugby union, or you know, he has some. He's like a patron of the Welsh rugby union, I think. So that's possibly yeah. why Kitty Hawk had been used as a call sign because he was either visiting the players while they were training or, you know, he'd been to the game. I can't remember if there was a game on that night. But um, but with regards, one of the claims that Kaz Clark has always levelled and Gary Jones is that the local residents weren't notified that this was happening. Um, and the way to check that is by doing a NOTAM search, which um, is kind of a system whereby people, local residents and local councils are notified about um, military exercises or low flying aircraft around that area. And unfortunately, the NOTAM search only goes back so far, but somebody has managed to find um, two NOTAMs for February 26th and February 20, 25th. Uh, the first one says valid from nine o'clock on the 25th to seven o'clock in the morning on the 26th. Um, from the surface up to 5,000 feet, exercise chameleon, up to seven helicopters operating without lighting within a five nautical mile radius centered near Cladrissant. Aircraft will remain clear of controlled airspace. Non-participating military aircraft shall avoid the area. The second one was from midnight to four o'clock on February the 26th, up to 18,000 feet, exercise chameleon, parachute jumping exercise within a 10 nautical mile radius again, centered near Clantricent. The drop is contained within the following cone and there's a map. So the public were notified and unless, well, I suppose unless you knew where to find that information, you wouldn't know about it. So it's no surprise that people were wondering what was going on. But the fact that these no terms do exist indicate that there were high-level parachute jumps going on. And the, if it's happening at night, you know, up to four o'clock in the morning in February, it's going to be pitch black. So it makes sense that these parachute jumpers do have some kind of visible identification on them, such as red LEDs, which is often the case in nighttime sky jumps. It's the holiday season, and that means there are stockings to be stuffed and elves to be cuffed. Well, today's sponsor, Manscaped, has gone global with the tools to guarantee you will score under the tree and the mistletoe. Manscaped is the leader in men's below the waist grooming and they have served more than 4 million men worldwide. You can get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com, supporting the podcast with code ANDYUFO. I have been a huge fan of the Weed Whacker at 35 years old. There's nothing worse than recording a podcast in the middle of talking to a former intelligence officer and your nose hair tickling the microphone. So it has been a godsend. Manscaped's best-selling product is, of course, the Performance Package 4.0, which is at the top of every man's wish list this year. 
inside you'll find among other things the lawnmower body trimmer the best trimmer on the market for your tic tacs butt and body and of course the weed whacker as well get the performance package now to receive their two free gift the manscaped boxers and the shed travel bag too these formulations are all vegan cruelty free dye free sulfate free and paraben free so you know the products are legit make sure you hurry to their site to ensure these gifts show up before the holiday season and while you're at it get that 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with code ANDYUFO whether it's for you your partner your dad your brother friend someone you love someone you hate get them something they will actually use and it's almost guaranteed to get a laugh last time folks 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com supporting the podcast with code ANDYUFO Just doing a quick check on the the February twenty sixth, twenty sixteen uh, rugby. Wales played France at the Principality Stadium, and Prince William was in attendance, who is a vice royal patron of the Welsh Rugby Union. So I imagine that again, just as the detail of what you were looking for. So yeah, absolutely yeah. spot on in terms of the date. There was a rugby game on, and of course, any number of royals and celebrities would have been in attendance at that as well. It was quite a big game at the time. So so yeah, spot on, gents. Graham, you want to come in there? Yeah, it's just um, just an explanation about NOTAMs. It means no, notice to airmen. So there are actually things to uh, advise other airmen as well, so like private pilots about things that are happening in the airspace around the UK. The descriptions that Dave gave of the, those particular days, those you can you see those uh, explanations for a whole load of exercises that happen right around the country you know, every week of the year. So you will see those kind of descriptions about the heights involved and often parachute jumps at night in different places. That wording, you know, it's quite standard. So there's nothing, you know, out of the ordinary at all for those two days. You will see that kind of thing replicated in different locations right across the country. Let me stay with you, Graham, on this as well. Now, you, you've mentioned military exercise. You've both mentioned, you know, the what's been described as being seen. Why are military exercises being held so close to? to a, a civilian area that's that's well populated why is this even able to be seen by with the naked eye so close up i mean they run out of places to train basically they, they don't like to train in the same place all the time so there's one thing where there's different parts of the country which are quite sensitive to low level f- of flying for one thing i'm just looking from that aspect so they try and change the routes that the aircraft fly the different areas where they do the low flying training but for ground exercises as well then it don't, you can only get so much value out of a certain place to use it over a certain period of time they have to look for new places or just change them round now it might be that the specifics of this particular exercise needed somewhere which was a bit closer to a built-up area um but then again you say we're in the now in the realms of trying to get the motives of the particular exercise and that's quite difficult especially from a special forces point of view because if you ask you know the the, the military or the government about any particular um sf exercise you will run against i believe it's 20, uh, section 26 you know, the, um, um you know in terms of foyer where you just don't get a response because they never, ever comment on special forces matters. So if any exercise has any, even just a hint of an element of this kind of thing, that's what you run up against. But there will probably be some reason and, and why suppose, it was so close. I was going to say, I suppose, again, for me being a total novice on this, that a, a, an area can be picked and designated because it resembles, for example, a mountain range in Afghanistan. Yeah. It could be similar and they pick it just, and that's why you're not going to find out, are you, that why they've picked that? Would that be along the right lines? Well, they've done them in Newcastle upon time before. So um, they used to use the heliport to bring in uh, Chinooks with special forces on board. So it's not as if they haven't done this kind of thing in built up areas before. Sure. Dave? Yeah, just adding on to that, um, before West Ham United left Upton Park and moved to the uh, Olympic Stadium in London, um, before they demolished Upton Park, they did have a special forces training exercise in the ground um, just to make use of the facility in an urban setting and preparing themselves for you know any terrorist attack at a large event such as the Olympics or the World Cup or whatever. Um, so it does happen. And you know, these local residents in London at that time, they weren't notified either. So they're hearing all these explosions and, you know, gunfire coming from the stadium and they wonder what's going on. Um, but I will say at the end of the path where Kaz, well, Kaz Clark viewed all this from a gate, um, 
which you know leads into a few fields which are privately owned. And there's a pathway, and at the end of this pathway, there's a quarry. Um, and you know some of the training has been done in the quarry as well. You know ground forces. So as you say, you know replicating Afghanistan or you know some kind of terrain like that. You know that quarry was obviously going to be used. Um, there was another thing that she mentioned. Um, you know, this exercise coming in this particular year was a counter-terrorism exercise as well, I found out. And part of the training was done with the Cypriot National Guard. Now, whether they were in Wales as well, I haven't found out yet. But the fact that the next day she went back and she was asking all these military personnel what they were doing there and she wasn't getting a clear answer or she was getting different answers. If you're on a counter-terrorism training exercise, and somebody from the public asks you a question, you are not going to give them a straight answer because you've effectively failed that training exercise if you do. So for her and other witnesses to complain about that, that it's kind of like a non, non-event for her to actually um, make that assumption that they're hiding something from her, from her. Yeah, sure. Graham, you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, really, in my experience of being close to military um, personnel when they're actually doing exercises, I've attended forward air control exercises, I've controlled, I've attended live bombing exercises uh, in the past. And if you get too close to them when they're actually trying to carry out their duties, you often get either short shrift or you'll get some kind of like, you know, kind of sort of... um, acerbic comments or just kind of deflection um you know if you ask stupid questions you win stupid prizes kind of thing so it's not surprising that they would try and either fob her off with some kind of strange story or something else or just tell her to get lost um it, it's not uncommon for the military to not to be a bit funny when civilians are either asking questions or are in the area of when they try to do their job basically no, I appreciate that. I'm going to come back to Dave on on a point I want to make. Now, yeah. I I've said before several times, including quite recently, that especially speaking to experiencers and and people who have sightings like myself, that it's just my story. That's it, and take that at face value. That this is no slight against individuals, but on this occasion, Kaz Clark is the main witness and has has in, in a the best way put herself out for scrutiny as anyone does when they share their story or experience we have described a lot of issues with this whole incident at the time um that w- that's i think is building a nice case for the fact this wasn't a ufo experience the one thing that turned me off the case before i even got interested in it was and this was from some of the listeners who got in touch with me to tell me that Kaz Clark had claimed on various interviews to have no interest in UFOs before this incident, which is is fine. That's that's common. Not everyone has an interest in the subject. However, people then managed to find on her public Facebook profile uh, from that very January, she was sharing Stephen Greer's um, citizen hearings videos from YouTube. So there clearly was an interest in the subject. Not to say that proves it didn't happen, but straight straight away there's an issue there with the the witness and how sincere they may be and are they looking for something that wasn't there dave is that the route you tend to think with this as well well if she had no interest in ufos then what was she doing in a couple of camp chairs uh in the middle of a february night freezing cold watching a military exercise and then the next day doing a MUFON light investigation in the local area. Um, you know, they went out with diet counters. They went out um, asking questions of the military that were there. And she even described what she said was a pyramidal UFO that just appeared from nowhere. And then the military started firing on it, and there was this whole dog fight. But she claims that this whole incident lasted for four minutes. Now, if she had no interest in UFOs prior, what was she doing there in the first place at this time of night? And how did she know that the military was waiting for a UFO to appear? 
Graham, you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I mean, she, part of the I heard an interview where she was talking about uh, Hercules aircraft, uh, RAF Hercules air transports chasing after uh, whatever this thing was uh, around you know, around the area. Now that would have taken probably more than four minutes because those aircraft don't turn on a dime. You know, they, they take a long time to turn around and to fly up and down valleys and all the rest of it. They're not the aircraft that I would choose if I was chasing after you know what I might thought would might have been quite a highly maneuverable object. Uh, it, it they seem strange aircraft to be involved in some kind of chasing down like a, you know the, the, the hunters after the hound, uh, the hounds after the quarry kind of chase it, it none of this really made sense to me either what i would ask is are there any elements and we'll, we'll start with graham on this of this story that you do think are particularly strange or or do you feel there's enough there that you can cover with rational explanations I've not come across anything particular that can't necessarily be explained away. Whether or not they can all be explained away in terms of you know the entire um, kind of information, the things that were going on that night, I, I can't say. But there's enough there that they've come up with that other people and myself and Dave and others have looked at and go, well, actually, this could explain that. And it fits in with the night itself. Then to me, there's not much going on here. Um, I don't know the every element of the story because there, there, there may be things that they haven't either mentioned or there may be things I've missed. But all the things I've come across, there seems, there seems to be some kind of rational explanation for it. And then there are other elements of the story which simply have been refuted. So the mention about, about the hospital um, you know, being shaken to its, its, its foundations, I believe that was one element of the story. And yet the hospital made, you know, have, have been questioned and there's no such rec- record of you know, anything like that actually happening. So there's a few elements, that, including also the motorway being shut, the M4 motorway apparently being shut because of the incident. Uh, and yet, there's again, there's no you know, uh, sort of uh, corroboration on that score either. So there's elements of the story which have been suggested, which don't add up either. So I'm afraid, looking at it as a whole, it, none of it actually makes any sense at all, to me anyway. And that's just a personal observation. I've got nothing against the person concerned. I have no wish to try and knock something down. But I'm not, I'm not going to like stand by and, and let things just you know, sort of be played out when this seems to be a completely rational explanation for it. I don't like myths getting propagated. And Dave, what about yourself? Anything for you that stands out as still being unusual or unexplainable? The only thing that I need to investigate a bit more is the uh, radiation and the EMF readings that were taken um, because there's some slight discrepancy. But, you know, some people have suggested that Kaz and whoever it was who was doing it were reading the instruments wrong. They had basic level, well, entry level Geiger counters and EMF readers, and they were just unfamiliar with the um, the, the items they were using. They didn't, weren't sure how to use them, so they just put out a load of data and hoped that somebody would take a look at it and confirm what their story was. I mean, what we do need to say is um, this pyramid that she claimed to have seen um, you know, it kind of made the same sort of shape as you would expect with parachute jumpers igniting flares and then falling in a leaf-like motion. And then the kind of shape that they make as they come down lower to the ground, it does look like a pyramid. And her original sketches do show, you know, that kind of formation, although later on um, that's changed to an inverted pyramid once people started making the connection between pyramid you know, parachute flares. Um, Another thing that she claims is that one of the craft, she claims it was many craft, a few other craft as well, one was damaged and flew into the local, um, well, Clantrescent Forest, also known locally as Smilog Woods. Apparently this UFO came down and hit some of the trees and damaged some of them and caused burn marks on the trunks. Now, the problem I have with that is that there was an outbreak of a certain disease called um, large tree disease. Um, if you want the, the Latin name, it's Phytophthora remorum. For those... Uh, it sounds, it sounds very Harry Potter. Yeah, exactly. And it's easy for me to say. Um, but 
this, they discovered an outbreak in uh, Clantuson Forest and Smilog Woods in 2015 of this disease. And this will affect the coloration of the bark of the trees due to resin um, being bleeded out of the bark. And uh, she claims that there were white burn marks on these trees. Now, I don't know if any of you have, you know, when you burn wood, what color do you get at the end of it? You know, it's not white, is it? It's black. Because it's carbon based and, it, you know, you'll get black burn marks, not white. So the white is obviously, or could be, not obviously, sorry, it could be this resin which is affecting the trees. I mean, she claims that. The trees were snapped in half by this craft, although the canopy in the surrounding area is pristine. Um, and these trees were actually felled and replanted around 2017, 2018. But she seems to think that there's some whole conspiracy by the uh, National Forestry Group that, you know, they just removed these trees to find, to cover up any details of an alleged crash. And I think when it comes to this, just to re- re-emphasize that it's you're not what none of us are outright calling someone a liar. But with any UFO case, there are sometimes people who embellish their stories, they misidentify, they misremember. But some people sometimes do have very vivid imaginations, and I can't help personally think on this occasion that this is what's happened: that someone has taken parts of a story and ran with it, and then embellished on top of that. Again, that's just my opinion. I I would ask people that they, like Graham and like Dave have, go and do some of the research, go and look at some of the interviews Kaz and others have maybe done on the subject, listen to some of the, read some of the articles, there's plenty of them if you search Penturk at UFO. But then listening to this, listen to what Graham and Dave have said themselves, what they've found out, what they've researched. They've done some great work on it. If you've got questions, get in touch with them, especially on Twitter, where they spend a lot of their, their spare time uh, and ask them to, you know, to converse because they'll happily do that. Um, and the reason they've, they've joined me on this is because we still have people getting in touch, asking about this case. And I, I think just in this short podcast that you two gents have put forward a very reasonable argument as to why this wasn't something et or ut or whatever it may have been it was very much a human explanation i'll just ask you both to kind of wrap up for this one uh dave if you want to add anything before we head off yeah it was just uh, regarding the military uh people that they encountered the following day um and the next days and they said oh they're in hazmat suits and they were combing the ground and they had a laptop in a huge heavy duty case well, the laptop case is typical of those used um, when you're trying to protect sensitive electronics from EMP devices. So it, may, it stands to reason why, you know, if they're on a counterterrorism exercise and there's a possibility of, you know, EMP, you know, low-level charges or whatever like that, it stands to reason that you would protect any equipment that you're using. Um, with regards to the people in the hazmat and the supposed uh cleanup operation or uh, debris removal, as is claimed, that is standard operation for any military training, um, which is carried out, you know, on private land or, you know, National Trust land or anything like that. It's so that they can, you know, clear up any metal shards or any kind of equipment, shell cases or anything like that, which could damage livestock or, you know, cause serious injury to or damage to farm machinery or private machinery or anything like that. So that what she encountered is actually official protocol after a training event anyway. Perfectly fair. And uh, Graham, what about yourself? Anything you want to add before we finish up? Yeah, just just the various elements of the story would, uh, and if the, if they were to be true, then it would mean that the cover up would have to be in the hands of not just the military, but also South Wales Police, uh, the local forestry commission, possibly the council, possibly the hospital authorities. Um, so I think we're looking at too much here. I think we're looking at a story which you know, it seems, as you said before, may have just been blown out of proportion. Um, Again, I'm not wanting to, you know, sort of do any kind of hatchet job on the people concerned. I don't know them personally, but it just seems to me that this story has been um, embellished, you know, way beyond um, anything that you know it, it might have once resembled. 
Graham, what are you working on at the moment? Any more books in the pipeline? You seem to be churning them out at the moment. Yeah, the books tend to be on aviation subjects, though, at the moment. I'm not actually doing, well, I wasn't writing a UFO one um, last month. I, I am actually working on the initial stages of the next Foo Fighter book, which covers the Pacific. But I'm also sort of toying with the idea of doing a, um, a kind of general book about UFO cover ups uh, in terms of you know investigations. So I'm looking at what I can maybe put out in terms of a, uh, a book that's more aimed aimed at people outside UFO Twitter, so the general public, to get them in board in terms of you know the history of, of investigations and how they were twisted to try and say, look, there's nothing here to see. Um, a bit like Ross Coulthard's book, but just concentrating on that issue. So um, I'll have a think about that between here and now and Christmas, and then see what I come up with. Excellent. Sounds good. And Dave, of course, we've got the, the next issue of the magazine due out soon. You were teasing earlier on online. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and what we can expect? Yeah, well, if people um, weren't aware, I've had some uh, private family health matters over the past uh, few months, which has delayed um, the issue that was supposed to be out back in August or the start of September. So three months later than planned, um, that will be out hopefully within the end of the week and we can talk about that another time. Yeah, we will. We'll do a, a short preview pod on the magazine like we done for, for the last one, which people enjoyed as well. So again, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. This has been very late notice, but I hope it's given people some food for thought on top of that as well. Lots more to come. Next up on the podcast, we have the KGRA live at 11pm UK time on Friday the 3rd of December, but also the interview with Mary Rodwell who will be coming out in the coming days too. So thank you very much and speak to you soon. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAP, AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditate a game of fateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. back and nearly kissed myself, and I climbed out the window after the elf, and I woke up in my bed, and there was something on my head, and everything was weird, and everything was red, I called up my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems, and they think I should take care of me, and I don't know what it is, because it doesn't really scare me. Thank you.